are you doing? You look good. Listen, I'm trying. I'm trying to keep up with you. I'm trying to trying to be an internet superstar like you. Please. I said you everywhere. You you everywhere. I said I said I, I said I got the saying only God can do it. And then come I said I got I said I got to figure out a way. I said I, listen, this guy was the truth. I was uh was was telling my wife. I said uh I said Reg is getting to be so 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 famous. I said I hope you don't forget little people like me. Lord no. I said because oh, he Bishop Bishop. I'm gonna forget you, man. <laughs> and then you know your your work that you're doing with your conversation online. Uh, a lot of people are definitely connecting to you and what you're doing there in the great city of Chicago. Uh, and so we just thank again for you you taking the time to be with us um, today. You know, one of the things we've been trying to do with this this talk, uh, these teaching Tuesdays, is I've been speaking to various preachers and teachers on different subjects uh, as to uh, a few things. But one of the things that has started to really, really crystallize around our conversations was the COVID virus. Uh, this kind of started because we couldn't go to church. Uh, right. As a matter of fact, you and I know it affected something me and you were trying to do uh, back in March. Matter of fact, uh, you were to be with me and, and it just started to pop off. Uh, and, and so one of the things that I, I've always asked everyone is, when did you realize that the COVID virus uh, was, a, was a game changer and how did you have to adjust to it immediately? Well, you remember that week, I was supposed to preach for you that Friday night. That's right. I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the date was March 13th. Yep. So on March 11th, I got a call from the two leaders of my installation committee saying, Pastor, we, I think we're going to have to cancel your installation. Um, one of the members uh, works with, on, on like two or three boards in the city, uh, high up with Girl Scouts. And so she was like, we're canceling everything. And I think we need to cancel your installation, which was scheduled for April 4th. That's so right. March 11th, I get this call and they're panicking. Like, I think we, I said, nah, I said, hold, hold, hold on now. We, we can't, can't move in fear. I, you know, I gave all that churchy response, <laughs> those, 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 those churchy pastoral responses. Let's not move in fear. Let's move in wisdom. And when I realized minutes later, the NBA shut down that day, postponed the whole season. And then the uh, PGA Tours of Champions or the golf leagues uh, and nations shut down. And then Pastor Joel Osteen shut down and Bishop Ross Scott Cummer. I said, hold on now. Now, these folks got more people than me. They make more money than I, my organization. I said, if they are closing down, then we need to move in wisdom as well. So that's when I knew. I said, no, this is, this is serious. And, and, and unfortunately, Bishop, sometimes the church is the last group to exercise common sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, I really, and I appreciate you for being understanding that day because I called you and I was like, Bishop, I want to go home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was away in school that week. And so I was like, instead of me coming to preach in Florida, I thought it was best to go home and leave my church because I knew what was coming. We shut down that weekend too. So thank you for that space to be wise because you you could have you could have threw me away, Bishop. No, no. You know, and, and one of the things that uh, matter of fact, your conversation kind of like your like that lady's call, your call made me think, hey man, this this may be because I'm like you. I thought, okay, listen, this ain't gonna really do too much. Mm -hmm. But right. when I got that call from you, and matter of fact, the guy who preached before you told me. And when he went to the airport, there was nobody there. Wow. He said, he said, he said, we literally had never gone through check in and check out that quickly in our lives. And that's when I realized I said, ah, something going on with this. But again, I appreciate you, man. Matter of fact, I, I know I kind of have done this kind of out of order, but you know, a lot of people still don't know who you are outside of uh of maybe a few things. Well, tell them who you are and where you are right now and uh and, and kind of introduce yourself to the folks here a little bit. Well, well, I just, again, I'm grateful to be with you all. Bishop Pelt is my alpha brother, and we've been connected for years now. And, uh, and I came down to preach last July, was it? It feels like... Wow. June, 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 just June. a year. It had been, June, it, was, it had been a year. June, no. I was trying to get you back. Matter of fact, this month we would have done our summer meeting. So uh, right. it's affected everything. Because people were trying to get you for that as well. Man, and I just can't believe that a year has gone by. But I now pastor at uh, Fellowship Ch uh, Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church, also known as Fellowship Chicago, here in the city of Chicago. It was founded by Reverend Clay Evans. If you ever heard the song All Night, All Day, that's Reverend Clay Evans. If you ever heard the song I'm Blessed, uh, thank God I'm blessed, that's Reverend Clay Evans. 
and my, my immediate predecessor was Pastor Charles Jenkins. If you've ever heard the song, this means war, or yeah. my God is awesome. So fellowship has this rich music history and also a history of social activism. So God has sent me here since December 31st. My wife and I have been serving as, um, as leaders here at this church. I'm the senior pastor now. I'll get installed one day officially, but of course, <laughs> <laughs> According to all my members, they were like, Pastor, we, listen, was, that was formality. You are our pastor. We accept you. Go on and do what you got to do. We got your back. So that's a little bit of me. I'm in a PhD program now in African-American preaching at uh, Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis. And so I'm pastoring and, doctor and getting this doctorate. Those consume my time mostly. So it's, as a matter of fact, I, I'll, I'll even use that as another jump. What has been your educational kind of a uh, uh, trajectory because I think you were at Morehouse and uh, where did you go after, after Morehouse? Yes, sir. So uh, I went to Morehouse for my undergraduate, uh, studied religion, uh, attained my uh, my degree in religion there, and uh, then I went on to uh, Yale, and I, I stayed for one semester, transferred to Vanderbilt, finished my first master's there, attained my second master's at Emory University Candler School of Theology there in Atlanta, and then now I'm in this program. So I've been in school for pretty much for the last 10 years of my life. <laughs> now, let, now, let me ask you this question, because this is, this, I, I promise to everybody, I promise you, those who are watching by Zoom, if you have a question, you know how to get to the chat. Uh, we'll make sure we get the question and answer. To those of you watching Facebook Live, as you know, I'll do my best to kind of work my eyes back and forth, but we'll, we'll get those questions. But in the time that you were even in school, you almost like a child prodigy preacher. So, mm -hmm. so I, I always tell people, I ain't just, I didn't just hear about you early, uh, uh, lately. I remember when you were, I think your pastor was Pastor Shepherd. Pat, my, yep, my first pastor was Pastor Shepherd, and then Dr. E. Dewey Smith. And so, so I've known you from the Shepherd days, because uh, wow. because because of because of video, some of your stuff was already on YouTube uh, when you had Afro. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. But, but would you share with people your your actual preaching pulpit ministry trajectory as well to kind of to kind of tell people that you're not a journey come lately you may be young but you uh you have great experience wow i i don't know about great experience i i i'm out here doing the best i can bishop i started preaching when i was 15 and um so pastor shepherd pastor for 47 years at greater travelers rest baptist church when i was 12 he retired and in March of 20, 2003, and then in December of 2003, Dr. E. Dewey Smith came. So he is a world-renowned preacher, respected across the length and breadth of our, of our country. And so that's where, as a preacher, I developed. Uh, I learned a lot from, about, about what a pastor should be from Reverend Shepherd. Uh, I didn't understand what he was preaching. I was too young, but he just had a pastor's heart, took time with people. And then Reverend Smith, of course, has that same people and I learned more about uh, preaching watching him and so at the age of 15 I started preaching and I didn't start in church I started at my high school there was something mm -hmm. called FCA Fellowship of Christian Athletes yeah. yeah and that's where I started teaching the football team the basketball team and the band and I started right there and then from there my pastor realized like okay you preach for everybody else come preach for me so I started I became his preaching assistant I served at our second location at House of Hope Atlanta I was in I was in Macon for three and a half years and from mm -hmm. there <clears throat> God directed me to Chicago now as I'm giving you the quick end of the story because I when I left Macon Chicago wasn't even on my radar mm -hmm. I just knew my season was up and I talked to my pastor, I said, I feel a shift, like God is calling me somewhere and I don't know where. It was an Abrahamic experience. Go right. to a land, I'll show you. So basically it's walk, 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 and when you get there, I'll say stop. So I started walking and I ended up here in Chicago and became the successor of Pastor Charles Jenkins officially on December 31st, 2019. Now, even in that, because I'm, 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 I'm building something, because I'm trying to share people that, that you can trust your life to God education, mm. ministry, but in this time you got married. So now you, you pick up a wife on this journey. So yeah. talk about that if you don't, now listen, I, I hope I hope Lady Bree don't get mad. Tell Lady Bree, we, we want her to come to Florida. So the next time you come, you just gotta bring Lady Bree with you. That's right. Uh, but, but 
But talk about you getting married in ministry and how even in this trajectory, you've been able with the grace of God to manage ministry and marriage along with all of these educational endeavors. Uh oh, you, you you hit the mute button. Uh oh, let me see. Let me see what happened. There. That's there we good. Go. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I I muted and then it didn't want to let me unmute. So we good. <laughs> so yeah, in 2015, man, the story is just wild. So I was in school at Vanderbilt in Nashville. And um, during that period, 2014, at the later part of the semester, November 2014, I proposed to my wife. And mm -hmm. I had started that program there in Nashville. At the same time, the week after the week before I proposed, Pastor Smith announced that House of Hope Making was starting. Mm. So I've never had a smooth journey. Uh, I, I just, it's always been the most, you know, when everything I've done has been the most. And it was, and here's the thing, some people look for attention, Bishop, and, and they're looking to be out there, looking to go viral. I feel like Forrest Gump. I just, I just felt like running. I was just running. I was running, minding my business and you know, I fell in love with my wife, so I'm about to propose, and my pastor's like, oh yeah, and you're about to go to be the campus pastor in Macon, which is an hour south of Atlanta, and so, and I'm in school. So I'm in hmm. school with my master's at Vanderbilt, which is a very rigorous program. I'm getting married, um, and I'm pastoring a brand new startup church, all at the same time. So I've needed uh, mental therapy for a long time. <laughs> so yeah, Bree, Bree's been by my side December, 2015 will make five years that we've been married. I can't believe the time has flown by that fast. Y'all so been married five years? In December, it'll be five years. Good Lord. Isn't that crazy? So so she, she she was raised by a father who was a pastor. Her grandfather was a pastor. So I, I, didn't, I didn't fall in love with her and, and marry her because of that, but it was just a blessing. I don't have to explain ministry to my wife because she right. understands ministry. And so that's, you know, it's been a journey and balancing it all. I don't know how I've balanced it other than keeping my feet on the ground. Uh, my friends have been a gift to me. They keep me normal. They, they, they give me space to be myself and laugh and be silly. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm just grateful for my family, my friends and my wife, because they have really kept me human, no mm. matter how high or, or even how low I've got times. Well, man, I, I really appreciate it. Again, I hope that those watching on Zoom, those watching on Facebook Live, mm -hmm. uh, again, in a few minutes, we definitely give you a chance to do some question and answer. So if you want to start putting them together, let's start working on it. But let me ask this. You have, uh, uh, I'll stay a little light because I'm going to get heavy in a little bit. So let me get the light stuff out of the way. Come on. Uh, you, you have become also a viral sensation, almost, almost un- Unwittingly, I, I saw you uh, do your, your time with Kev on stage. Uh, you've become a viral sensation twice. I mean, twice you know, most, you. Yeah, yeah, most, most people don't most people don't even get it once. But you you go from you you go from only God can do it having a Baptist fit to we ain't having no church. Don't be texting me and posting me. How did that happen, man? Just being myself. I mean, when I was shouting, I was being myself. Uh, when I was making my announcement, like I said, I'm very, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm silly by nature, always have been. Uh, and I was reflecting on that. My wife asked me when I went viral the second time, she said, how do you feel? Like, do you feel any different from the shouting viral? You know, I went crazy. Only God can do it. <laughs> I'm still there. And, and I kept on stage, called it the pistol praise. My, my and, sister uh, called it the pistol phrase. She said, tell me to do his fingers like this. <laughs> my sister went, there you go. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. But, um, you know, just being authentic, being yourself. Uh, honestly, that's that's all it has. So my when my wife asked me how did I feel, I said I slept when I went viral the first time. I slept when I went viral this time. I, I actually went viral in 2018 off of an okay. interview where I made. You know, it was a you know just I was wrestling with some theological thoughts and right. I expressed them the wrong way. And man, the church took off and they were ready to hang me. I mean, literally ready to jump them. And I was like, wait, I didn't word it right. I wasn't, ex I was trying to make a point, but said it the wrong way. So I've gone viral three times in a matter of 14 years of ministry. And, wow. one, that, and, and one preacher said to me this, he said, may this show you that your voice matters in the kingdom. 
No need to get depressed, no need to become worried, but we have to be responsible with our voices and our platforms. And so for me, I just, it was a reminder, listen, I just can't say anything. I just can't do anything. People are watching, but I'm not going to stop being me either. So I was being myself both times. So I went and slept very good all through it. I lost no sleep, Bishop. Uh, well, you know, I think that's a perfect segue to, to maybe get into some heavier matters. You just made a statement that I think that one of the things as a bishop that I want my ministers to know, even my people to know, that the power of words is critical in this hour. Yes. Uh, it is, if, you know, I, I guess I never really thought about the verbal communication uh, much. You know, you, 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 you're you happy when the child makes their first sound. You're excited when they say mama, daddy. And so you kind of go through life hearing sounds, but you really don't, you, you become numb to them. But I'm seeing with the virus and the violence that words are so critical. And you have been a wonderful spokesman uh, to that. What would you say to young old ministers in this hour that God may be speaking to you that he's asking for his church to speak into the atmosphere right now. Mm. You know, I was meditating the other day, Bishop, reading about John the Baptist, and they were trying to figure out who he was. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? He said, uh, they went through a litany of questions. Are you this? He said, no. Are you, are you, are you the, the Messiah? He said, no. Are you Elias? No, are you a prophet? No. He said, I am a voice crying out in the wilderness. When he got ready to describe himself, he described himself by not even a description of a human. He described himself by a sound. Mm -hmm. He described himself as a, as a vehicle, as a vessel. I'm a voice. And we have to understand that in this day and time, as you said, with the virus, with the violence, with the pandemic, with the protests, uh, with our president, mm. we cannot afford to hide behind the safety of our pulpits. We cannot afford to hide behind the safety of our silence when people literally cannot breathe in our streets and in our mm. communities. I find it highly ironic that the pandemic takes people's breaths away. It's a respiratory virus that affects the breathing systems in our bodies. Um, George Floyd, who died last Monday, could not breathe. The first autopsy said he died of underlying health is issues. The autopsy yesterday said no, it was asphyxiation. The same mm -hmm. way Jesus died, he suffocated to death. And so you have a community that can't breathe. We then cannot waste our breath by choosing to be silent, choosing to be scared, choosing to be safe. Because let me tell you something now, and, 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 I, and I'm going to make somebody mad, and I don't care if I do, Bishop. You can't even hide behind the scriptures right now. Because nope. you got a president that'll walk out in front of an Episcopal church he's never attended, hold a Bible he's never read and doesn't live by, and hold it up for a prop, hold it up for a picture. And while we want to critique President Trump for holding up that Bible as a prop and as a picture, preachers in our pulpits do that every week. When, 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 say that again. And listen, I want everyone to be clear. I have no problem in this. Say that again, because I need people to understand. Maybe that's what we've done. We we made the Bible a prop, and, and I'm gonna tell you something. We've been a costume. So so listen to you, Bishop. We gotta quit using stuff in the scripture and the spiritual as props, because that's one of the reasons we got some of this protest. Because we have lived prop lives, and people say we die in real lives. Come on, and the, and while the scripture is real, my issue is not what he was holding up. It was how he was holding it up. You're holding this up as a weapon against people to say, stay in your place. You're using this as a weapon against people to say, I'm, I'm with Jesus. And it's like, no, but Jesus didn't stand for that. Jesus was with the poor. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to set them at liberty, which are bound, help the blind. And that's not just physical, it was metaphorical. You gotta help people see. 
We got to set people free. We have to be in the business of standing with people who are underprivileged and disinvested and marginalized and oppressed. And if you are a preacher and you can stand in the pulpit and not address what's going on in society, shame on us. Shame on us. We have to use our voice. That's the question. What should we be doing? Use your voice to speak. Now, even if you agree violence in the way, I don't like rioting. I don't think rebelling. I'm not asking you to agree with anything. I'm asking you to use your voice responsibly. And, and before you critique a, a riot or a rebellion, critique the racism that created it in the first place. See, it's irresponsible to address the effects and you won't deal with the cause. Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, oh, they damaging property, but they've been damaging lives for thousands of years. You ain't say nothing. So why all of a sudden do you care about people's properties? You ain't say anything about people's bodies. Mm. And let me close with this, because I you done got me started, Bishop. You shouldn't have no, asked no, me. That, that, this, this teaching too, that's why I got you here, buddy. That's why I got you here. You know, it's a quote that I want to read, and I'm going to pull it up so I don't quote it wrong. It's so good. After the riots of 1907, Dr. King quoted Victor Hugo. And mm. Victor Hugo says this. He says, if the soul is in, if the soul is left in darkness, sins will be committed. The guilty one is not he or she who commits the sins, but the one who causes the darkness. Mm. Got me? Mm. Yeah. If the soul is left in darkness, sins will be committed. But the guilty one is not he or she who commits the sin, but the one who causes the darkness. So what, what I'm saying is we can't critique those who are sinning if you don't critique the darkness that caused the sin. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Racism is the darkness. Bigotry is the darkness. Police brutality is the darkness. Immoral, asinine leadership from the White House is the darkness. And if you have nothing to say about the darkness, then don't be quick to critique the sin of rioting, destroying property, looting, stealing, you know what I'm saying? Protest. Yes. And, yes. and what I'm seeing Black people are not, what, what we're all missing is we got to critique for the riots and the rebellions, but no critique for the sin of racism. And, and that is a great, great challenge. Let me, let me even ask this, because uh, one of the things that, that I'm finding, and I thought about it, just as you have been uh, well-versed at Yale and Vanderbilt, have you had contact conversations with people of other races who are asking, how did we miss it? And how have you been able to, to transverse or at least converse with them on this issue? Because I think, I think there are many who do want to know. But they, yeah. they, they were not aware they didn't see. They were not aware they didn't know. And now they just freaked out about what they're seeing. So how have you been able to help uh, those in that regard? I'm, you know, I'm, I, I, I just beg to differ, Bishop. I, you, you cannot live in America and say you didn't see and didn't know. It, it, it's in the fabric. <laughs> <laughs> I agree now, I agree. Oh, oh God, it, it's in the fabric of our nation. Racism. I was reading this book by uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, and uh, man, let, let, let me open put it up. up to this. I, that's, one, that's one of the things. Yeah, go, this is a great book. If you want to read up on a fresh perspective on, on race relations in this country, Between the World and Me by Ta-Nehisi Coates. Let me read this quote to you, and then I'm going to answer your question quickly because I don't want to waste anybody's time. On page 103, so he writes this whole book um, as a letter to his son. He writes this whole book as a letter to his son, and this is what he says to his son in, in 103. He says, here's what I would like for you to know. In America, it is traditional to destroy the black body. It is heritage. You got that? In America, it is traditional to destroy the black body. It is heritage. It is the tradition of America to, to, to not value the body of black people. So we've been raped, we've been lynched, we've been plundered, we've been assassinated, we've been bombed. But we love to see y'all throw a football. We love to see y'all throw basketball. So we don't value your body other than it becoming a commodity for our use. Mm. We love to see y'all dance. We love to see y'all play sports. We love to see y'all put on a show. We love to see y'all act. We love to hear y'all rap and sing and perform. 
And it's so it's a using of our bodies, but not a valuing of our bodies. And so, man, no, nobody can say they didn't know that. You, 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 you can't grow up in this country don't know that. But what I've done over time, I thank God for the allies. I will say every white person is not racist, but every white person benefits from white privilege. <laughs> just like all men, just like all men are not sexist, but all men benefit from male privilege. So, say that again, because I think that's, that's a critical point. Yeah, it's like I, I got some, I got some people on, I got some people on Facebook hitting you. So say that again, because I, I I'm work, watching you on on Zoom, but they're always blowing up Facebook. Hopefully, <laughs> blowing it up. <laughs> well, I I hope everybody will be my friend after this. You know, it. Oh, they love you. They love you. You, you ain't getting up but love over here. Well, let me tell you. So so while you while every white person is not racist, every white person I think this is my opinion benefits from white privilege. And while every man is not sexist, every man benefits from male privilege. So it, it becomes the responsibility of white people when it pertains to racism, understand your privilege and make sure that you become an ally to the causes of black people. Don't, don't sit in silence. No, if you see something, use your Instagram, use your Facebook to say, I stand against this. And a lot of these protests aren't just black folk. It's white That's folks, right. it's, it's Jews, it's Muslims, it's, it's people from all over who are saying, I'm not black, but I'm standing with them. And it becomes the responsibility of people to do that. And then even when it comes to issues of sexism, just so people can understand the parallels, it becomes our responsibility as men to acknowledge our privilege and say, yeah, a system set up that privilege us as men, but we have to decenter ourselves and make space for women because somewhere I read in that Pentecost narrative actually oh. about him wanting to pour out his spirit on all flesh and, and, and sons and daughters. The and, huh? And, and then the yeah. young men and the old men and the slaves. and the, So, no, 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 no. We, we, we have a job. What we need in this country is a Pentecostal revival. And that does not mean that we shout all over the streets. That means that we let the, the spirit, the, the ruach, the second wind of the Holy Spirit, the same ghost that was over the waters in Genesis 1. I like Pentecost because now we get a second wind, as my brother, Pastor Charlie Dates calls it, the second wind. We need that because when the Spirit is really working, we can hear each other, man. That's what I preached on Sunday, Bishop. Mm. The title was America's Greatest Problem. Mm. And, 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 and it was so simple, I was almost embarrassed to preach it. America's greatest problem, I preached from Acts 2, it was Pentecost. Right. America's greatest problem is we don't know how to listen to each other. Hmm. On the day of Pentecost, the Bible says that, the, that they could hear each other in their own oh. language. I, I'm, I'm trying not to shout, but you know I'm liable to do yes, it. Sir. They, they, they could hear each other in their own languages. And so when this speaking of tongues is not the same as 1 Corinthians 14, because in 1 Corinthians 14, the Greek word there is glossolalia. But in, in Acts 2, the Greek word for tongues is xenoglossia. X-E-N-O-G-L-O-S-S-I-A. Xenoglossia, which means xeno, where we get the word foreign, and then glossia, like we get the word glossary, uh, yeah. is where we get our word speech from. It's foreign mm -hmm. speech. And so you have people from the Medes, from Mesopotamia, from mm -hmm. uh, the Parthians, and, and the and Egyptians. Ooh, we. It's a, it, it, Egypt and the Cyrene, right there. Come on. And, and, and yeah. the Egyptians and Cyrene and, and the Jews and the proselytes, they could all hear each other in their own. So I said to my church, and I say to you all, the real movement of the spirit is not in how high you jump when you shout, but it's in how, how intent you can be to listen to people who normally you wouldn't be able to understand. When white mm -hmm. folks and black folks can listen to each other, you know the Holy Spirit is moving. When a Baptist and a, and a, and a Presbyterian can listen to each other, a Catholic and a, you know, and a, uh, and a Protestant can hear each other, when a Muslim and a Buddhist can hear each other, when a gay person and a straight person can hear each other. Now listen, we ain't got to agree, but, but my job since I got the Holy Ghost is to listen. And what I wanna argue is, I don't think a lot of white folks have the Holy Ghost in this country. 
because of their unwillingness to listen to black folk who don't look like them, think like them. I don't think black folks have the Holy Ghost. I don't think some preachers got no. Let me let me be clear. I want to be fair. I don't think a lot of our churches got the Holy Ghost like we think we do. Because when the Holy Spirit is present, there is the interpretation of people I normally can't hear, and then there's liberation because That's the right. Spirit is on all flesh, not on the flesh you like, not on the flesh you agree with, but there's interpretation. I can hear you, and I'm understanding it, not hearing you to respond, not hearing you to argue. I'm hearing you to feel your suffering, to see your perspective, and then there's liberation. And I doubt, Bishop, that most, a lot of our churches think we got an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. But I don't know how much we do because we can't listen to each other. And, and it's so funny. I put a Facebook post within my tribe saying that was one of the one of the great challenges. I know we've lost the ability to be civil, even in being somewhat confronted. You know, back in the days, uh, debates were done as, as entertainment. And people would, would cut one another down but the debate was was civil. We've mm -hmm. lost that. And I always tell people one of the things I've been concerned about within the body of Christ is we've lost the ability to be civil, but we've also lost the ability to be convincing. So mm -hmm. that's why we're not civil. So we go to other routes. Since we can't be civil, let me just be combative. No, mm -hmm. you've got to be convincing. One of the things that, that Peter does on the day of Pentecost is he takes the ability of saying, now that you hear me, let me be civil and convincing. We ain't drunk as you suppose. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, God, listen, I see, the, I see the misunderstanding. You've seen my actions That's as right. one thing. I need to educate you. My actions are not an indication of this. They're an indication of that. Yeah. And let, let me just ask you, how have you been able to, to hone yourself to be not only civil, but convincing? So I, even in this concept, what are some of the tools you use? Because this... I'm telling you, they are literally blowing the Facebook over here. But what are some of the tools you use to help you do what you do uh, as, as a communicator of the gospel, just a great communicator at all? Doctor, the late Dr. Sandy F. Ray says every preacher needs a gallery and a garden, a sermon gallery and a sermon garden. That's my gallery back there. That's just a piece of it. I got a whole nother bookshelf in my office. I got most of my books in boxes somewhere. And I'm not to say I've read everything, but I keep knowledge around me. Um, I don't watch the news a lot for my mental health, but I do watch as much as I can to stay up on it. I read an article, I get the facts, I get the statistics. Because when the microphone swings your way, you can get up and say, Jesus is the answer. But let me tell you something, you better be able to articulate what's going on in this country as well in an intelligible fashion. Uh, for instance, I had an interview with a guy who opened his church in Chicago and I was a preacher who didn't open my church and they put us side by side on Chicago tonight, two weeks ago. And all they wanted to know, Sharp, tell us why you stand where you stand and the other gentleman stood where he stood and he made a mistake. <laughs> Before it turned back to me, he said, I'm a man of faith and facts. And we have constitutional rights to go to church. Nobody can tell me I can go to church. And I, Lord, I said, I can't wait till it's my turn. And as you said, no, no, no need to come back. Let your mind work. Let your words work. Because I read something the other day that said, um, uh, 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 it said, lightning doesn't grow flowers. Rain does. Mm. And rain is normally quiet. <laughs> uh, lightning and thunder is loud but they don't grow flowers you know rain it, it, so, so my point is you can be loud as you want to and argue if you want to but you better be able to think clearly and uh, so I said to him in response he's a man of faith and facts and he had the nerve to share that he's in a doctoral program and I'm sitting there like I am too I ain't about to tell these people that on this thing and so what I, what I said to him Bishop was I said well I, I hear my brother, called him my brother. He was a white man. I said, I, I hear my brother. I respect his point. I said, I'm a man of faith and facts too. I said, the facts are that America has more COVID-19 cases than any other country in the world. The facts are that the state of Illinois, of which our pastor is number three 
in the leading states of the most COVID-19 cases in this country. The facts are that Black people are disproportionately affected by COVID-19 in our communities because of underlying health issues, educational and health disparities. So I got faith but I also have the facts. And for that reason, my church will remain open, but the building will remain closed. Let me, let me, shout, let me shout for you. <laughs> <laughs> so you see what I'm saying? But you gotta be well, if I didn't know the facts, if I didn't have, if I didn't have the stats, you know, I, I, I can quote Genesis, I can quote Acts, I can quote Zechariah, but you need to be up on what's going on. That's what I'm telling you. This book, life-changing, life-changing. Let me tell you something else. I, I got some books right here. Let me show you something else. Just just, just because you asked me, how do I stay up? You, you got to read Garden C. Taylor. You got to read hey, the Taylor. book. You know, you, you got to stay up on the preachers that have fought before us in generations. Dr. King has books on his sermons. Uh, Dr. King has a book called Strength to Love. If you are a clergy person, white, black, blue, green, purple, and you're in ministry, and you haven't read the preaching of Dr. King, I'm not talking about I have a dream king. I'm talking about Baptist preacher king who would get in the text and interpret the Bible for the times. You got to read that because that strengthens your intellectual muscles on how to respond. So how do I stay up on this being convincing without being combative? Read. Stay up on the current events. Number three, you need a circle of accountability. Um, there is wisdom. I think that's a, there's safety in the multitude of counselors. Isn't that in the book of Proverbs? It is. It's either in Proverbs or Psalms. I ain't going to lie to you which one. I, I, I can't remember. But it's one of them. One of them is with the P. Pop. It's, in the words of, it's in the words of wisdom. Then. So we, we put them in the wisdom books. That's, what we that's right. That's that's right. right. <laughs> uh, it, there is safety in the multitude of counselors. So I thank God for mentors. I thank God for friends. When I'm wrestling with something before I get out on social media, with all of my emotions, I will call my friends who I trust, call my mentors. How do you think I should respond to this intelligently? Am I thinking through this right? Am I off? What do you think? And I bounce my ideas around with my mentors and my friends and they help me. You know, um, you, you have just been in, incredible at this point. I would ask you something that I know a lot of people ask me, how do you plan your sermons? Mm. And, uh, are, do you plan to do book sermons uh, uh, so you stay with a book for a while, or uh, do you do topical, uh, do you do historical uh, character studies? So how do, you, how do you put your preaching calendar together? I guess that's the best way to ask that. Let me say, oh, that's a heavy question. I, I'm, I'm going to be honest. There is one primary question that I enter, that I engage in, when I'm getting ready to preach to my congregation. That one question is, is this, and it's not deep. God, what do your people need to hear this Sunday? Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that is my, if I can label it, that's my prayer question. Mm -hmm. God, what do your people need to hear this Sunday? Um, and sometimes I, I plan ahead. And I and I have a, a I had a series in the month of May, gifts in the fire. I was gonna do three parts. Man, all this stuff broke out, started happening, and I went viral for closing the church down. I said, well, I, I can't stay in that series right now. I got to speak to what the people need to hear. Right. And um, so I always preach uh, with the content of the Bible and the context of the country and the world in conversation. I put the content of the Bible, of Scripture, the content of Scripture in conversation with the context of the world in conversation. You, 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 you cannot preach the content of, of Scripture without putting it in conversation with the context that the people are in. Uh, one one, one homiletician put it like this. Don't just exegete the text, exegete the people. Mm -hmm. So when mm -hmm. I came to your conference, Bishop, you had a theme, right? Last June. Yep. Dr. Cosby and I, whether the people realized it or not, you had a theme. And whatever that theme was, we wanted to preach in context. Mm -hmm. So some preachers get up. Now listen, this is what the Lord told me. Now y'all over here talking about apples and bananas. 
and I come talking about pears and mango. <laughs> No, if, if the if the if the person that invited me, see if I'm at my church, I, I got freedom, me and the Lord, whatever the people need. But when I come into your context to preach to your people, you invited me to your platform and you say the theme is apples and bananas. It's my job to seek God to say, how do I speak to this conference on apples and bananas, not pears and mangoes? <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? It's context is everything. And then I would also add, how do I prepare to preach? I'm going to be honest with you. I want to drop a couple of things. I shared this on another live, and this is just a couple of things. This is not everything. I have about six things, but I'm going to give you about three. I look at uh, preparation. I take preparation seriously. I take my uh, uh, simplification. I take that seriously. I take imagination seriously. I'm going to give you some more. I take illustrations seriously. I take the presentation seriously. And I take the celebration seriously. <laughs> and I would also add a seventh one, application. <laughs> now, if I had time, <laughs> and I would need a whole nother hour. <laughs> If that is, if that's not a great preacher line, if I had time, if, well, that, that's if, a preach right there. If I had time, if, if, if I had time, I would tell you, <laughs> preparation is spending time with God before you get to the people, reading everything you can. If I had time, I would tell you, simplification is being profound has nothing to do with how many great thinkers you can quote. It's about, can you make this live for Grandma Nam and Junebug? I don't care if you read Rudolph Boltman. I don't care if you read Paul Tillich, Martin Luther King, Kelly Brown Douglas, James Cone, James Baldwin, Maya Angelou. I don't care what you read. If you can't make it make sense to Junebug and Grandma, you're wasting your time and the people's. Simplify. There is profundity in simplicity. Mm. Imagination. Don't just tell me the, the story, use your, we black. This is the cocoa. Come on now, this cocoa. <laughs> Listen, actually and symbolically, this is flowing <laughs> cocoa. This is, we are black preachers. Most of, and even if you're not black preacher, you need to study black preachers because when we could not go to school, we had to use our, what we call spiritual imaginations. And so for instance, I could tell you, God said, let there be light and there was light. Or I could say, God stepped out on the invisible platform of nothingness, reached back into the archives of eternity, grabbed the blueprints of the universe, and somehow out of nothing made everything. God got ready to make the world, and he needed there to be some luminous uh, electricity in the darkness of eternity. So God said, let there be light. While God was talking, and got ready to say, let there be light. Sun, moon, stars, and all the galaxies were in the hallway of heaven, lined up waiting to hear which name God will call first. When God said, let there, they all leaned up. When God said, be light, sun said, excuse me. He's calling my name. And whenever God calls you, whatever you weren't, you become it quickly. Because when he calls you, you have to be what you've never been. And there was light. You see what I'm saying? That yeah. is spiritual imagination. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't. I didn't make. I didn't lie to you. I just used poetry. I used creativity to paint a picture that was dull. You know, feeding the five thousand. You can tell me that story, or you can say that little boy went home. We don't know it, but spiritual imagination says he went home that day. And his mama said, "What were you doing today?" She said, "Where's your lunchbox? I gave it to this man. Why you give your food to a man?" She said, "Mama, he was different." Because everything he touched became more than it ever was after he touched it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> so let, if I had time, I would say. If I had time. I'm, I'm going to write a book. If I had time, I'm going to use that. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, get, let me move on. So now you need illustrations. Those are simple things that help you connect with people. Application illustrations go together. How can you apply the text to the real world? Don't just preach it. What is always every preacher listening to me listen we got to ask this question why do they care or why should they care if you can't answer that in your preparation don't take it to the presentation 
Why? Why do we care? Why do we care what you're telling me today? It has to be applicable, and the illustrations help that out, and everything preaches. Bishop, I want, to I want you to test me. Name an object right now that's somewhere in your room, and I'm going to prove to you that everything preaches. Uh, I, I, got, I actually just swipe my eyes. A piece of paper. Piece of, I just had a piece of paper I just wipe my eyes with. Okay, so you got a piece of paper that you just wipe your eyes. That piece of paper just started talking to me. Because when you held it up, it was balled up. And it looks like trash. But just because of the piece of paper, the Reverend Paper, paper Napkin just started talking to me. Pastor Paper Napkin. Just said, even when life balls you up, you can still be useful. Because although it's balled up, it still has the power to do what you need to do. So everything preaches. That's my point. So you can go to your pulpit and say, I had a paper napkin balled up and it started talking to me the other day. And sometimes you feel balled up and it looks like you're trash and you feel like you've been stepped on and you're disposable. But God can still use you to dry somebody's tears. Anything. And then presentation. Uh, I'm over here looking. Let the paper testify. The paper testify. It's testifying. It's testifying. And, 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 and then, and then presentation celebration. I close with this quickly because this is for my preachers. I love preachers. I got women. You got a lot of so listen, listen. But you know what? I want you to have the liberty because uh, this call is for our pastors, but it's also for our laity. Because I think sometimes laity does do not understand. Yeah. What the preachers are trying to get to them. Yeah. It's so hard. Some, yeah, sometimes it's, sometimes these conversations are needed for the lady to understand. Okay, now I understand why pastor does that. Mm -hmm. Because you know, you know, I, I thought about it, you get ready because I know you're gonna get your uh, celebration. But I thought about this. Right now, we have this what I call culture dichotomy in the African American church. Mm -hmm. There's a part of our church that feels, and I speak in, especially in the Pentecostal realm, that we are too spiritual to be scholarly. Mm. So, so you got this group that says, "I want." the references. But we have the other group saying, you guys are too scholarly to be spirit led. Mm -hmm. And you can and do preachers both. Are having, yeah, and preachers are having a really balance. The ability to say, like you said, when you said, put the put this cookies somewhere that everybody can get to it. That's right. Smart people can get to it. But if you get a dude off the street who don't know Greek, Hebrew, he barely know his name in Jesus, mm -hmm. I don't want him, I don't want him leaving going, what in the world? I, I, I feel like I've been drunk again. I don't want that. So no. I think that's a critical point you're saying. I, I, and, and, and what you just said is everything. That sums up my simplification point. Because you can read the scholars, but make it make sense. Yeah. And, and don't quote it trying to appear like you're so intelligent. Let the spirit work, but also bring your brain to the pulpit. We, yeah. we, got, we got enough dum-dums in the pulpit. We don't need any more dum-dums. And I know, I'm, I know that's you know, light and, um, and trite, but I, you hear me what I'm saying. We got too many dumb dumbs, and we wonder why people don't want to hear us no more is because we're irrelevant, we're not studied, we didn't read, we didn't prepare, we're not organized, we're up there for an hour. It's just not necessary. So let me close with presentations and celebration. Celebration doesn't mean you have to hoop. Celebration means, uh, like Frank Thomas, my, my um, oh. director of my program, he says that when the people experience the assurance of hope, they like to never quit praising God. Um, right. And he has a book entitled, They Like to Never Quit Praising God. And his mm -hmm. point is that you can't end a sermon without hope. There's a, there's a sect of preachers who believe you can't close the sermon without going to Calvary and getting them up. Oh, yes, sir, buddy. And I, and I, and I, you know, and that's fine if that's what people believe. But I think underneath that, I don't agree with that. But underneath that, what they're saying is, leave us with the hope don't and, and and definitely now you can't get him you can't kill him on friday and don't get him up. you got to get him up now you got to get him up and, yes. and 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 you got to be specific when he got up when did he get up bishop early early sunday morning early sunday morning you got to say early so the celebration is directing people to hope even if it's difficult even if it's tense but but end with hope that's celebration don't have to hoop you can whisper you can close in a prayer. You can close in an altar call. But whatever you do, leave us with the hope of the gospel, the hope of Christ. Presentation, I want to say three things. This is where preachers mess up. We, we all mess up. Because some of us do great in preparation and do horrible in presentation. 
Here's some simple tips. Make sure you guard your voice. You have to drink room temperature water. You can't drink ice cold water and eat ice cream and yogurt all day long because that, that messes with your vocal cords. So you up there hoarse five minutes in, how you gonna finish the sermon? Because you've been eating dairy, building up mucus, you've drinking ice cold water, it's freezing your vocal cords. Somebody told you to put lemon in your tea and lemon is acidic, it's working against you. Room temperature water and rest our preacher's best friend. That's going to help in your presentation. And also, secondly, get comfortable. If the microphone is on a stand and you like to hold it, take it off. Move around. Be you. Be comfortable. Every preacher needs some pulpit swag. Uh, you got to have your own swag. And I'm not saying it's about you. I'm saying be you. Don't get up there trying to, if you young or you a woman or you, uh, you talk a certain way normally like I'm talking to you now, don't get to the pulpit I want to thank God on behalf of all of those bishops who are with me today. I want to thank you for this invitation. That ain't how you talk. Uh, I was about to say, you know what I was about to say. That ain't how you talk. <laughs> so don't get up there because people, I know it's, it's silly and it's funny, but people know when you're being real. That's right. So pre, in the presentation, be yourself, guard your voice, and then thirdly, always 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 bring a smile to the moment to make people feel like you're honored to be there and acknowledge the pastor that invited you and don't ever think that somebody had to invite you because there are a hundred thousand preachers in this nation you ought to be humble enough to thank those people for giving you a chance to preach to them because it could be somebody else's opportunity and don't sit through the service the whole time like you irritated on your phone and on your iPad. And then when you get up to preach, now you want everybody to pay attention to you. That's arrogant. Act like you're preaching as soon as you walk through that door because your body language, your energy, and your attention preaches even before you get up to preach. That's all a part of presentation. And if you got an iPad, charge it because it will die. Ain't <laughs> <laughs> hey, that the truth? Or you like me, I don't know how to keep my screen on, so I'm constantly trying to punch a little code to get back in the greatest thing. You got to get somebody to help you put the unlock. Well, listen, man. I, I, uh, don't worry. My, I, I have this little running gag. As a matter of fact, this is a great segue for my wife. I think she's watching. Do you preach with a physical Bible, or do you preach with an iPad? My wife is a little old school. We, we kinda, you know, I don't know if you're too young to remember Donnie Marie and, uh, and uh, uh, her brother, uh, uh, Donnie Osmond and his sister she was a little bit. He was a little bit. She was a little bit country. He's a little bit rock and roll. My my Are wife does. My wife does not like for me to go without a physical Bible to the pulpit. She does kind of that way, and I like going home. So I take a Bible to the pulpit because I got to go home at some point. Uh, <laughs> but I'm trying. To, I'm trying to learn how to preach with the iPad. So do you take a, a physical Bible or iPad? How do you? What do you? What do you use when you kind of go? Let me ask you this. When Jesus was in the wilderness fighting the devil, did he have a physical Bible or was it in his yep. hey, see that? Hey, honey, you already just said Jesus didn't have no Bible. Now, he had now, no Bible. Now, Bishop. I, I, Reg, Reggie said that, baby. I want Bishop, to know Reggie said that. Now, now, listen. I love you and your wife. My <laughs> name is Bennett, and I ain't in it. <laughs> I'm just saying what I'm saying. That, you know, I think, I think sometimes a lot of the things we like are tradition. And they're not right. transformational. It is. Mm -hmm. It has no transformational value. Yeah. If you bring your iPad with the scripture on it, because I mean, my Bible is on my phone sometimes, and, and I'm right there reading the same way. And a matter of fact, I'm grateful for anybody that 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 has it. Now, I do like to carry my Bible to the pulpit because right. of the way I preach. It's something about having it. But there are times I walk up with nothing because I'm preaching off the top of my head, or I'm preaching on an outline, and I have a little piece of paper with some notes scrambled on it, and that's all I have, because the Lord is working with me that way. So I just say, as long as it's in your heart, <laughs> that's, that's what's most important. But I love your wife, so hey, don't, <laughs> I, don't want, I don't need, listen, I don't need no new enemies, and I don't need no new friends, I'm good. <laughs> listen, man. Look, you know what? Uh, I'm going to open up because I know we're, we're getting close to my hour time and I, I don't want to hold you too much longer. Uh, if you have a question, if you are on Facebook, you have a question, uh, please go to the chat to those in here if you would uh, do that. And if you have something on Facebook, uh, <laughs> my, my, wife said, my wife said, okay, Pastor. Honey, that directed at me or, or Pastor Sharp? I, 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 love, I love you, honey. I'm, I love you. That's right. 
I, I do. <laughs> so if you have a question, if you have a question, you want to go ahead and put it on Facebook Live. We want to definitely uh, put that out. If you have one, if you're with, on the Zoom call, go to the uh, uh, to the chat area and put it in. That'd be great. Let me let me close before we get into those because I definitely want you to speak to this. Mm -hmm. You are a young man, but you have spoken very prophetically to the present leadership that we have in this country. What would you say to, whether it be young or old, to those of us who have been called to preach this gospel, how can we either regain the prophetic voice mm. or how can we be strengthened in order to give a prophetic announcement? Because I, I see that over you, that you not only have a prophetic voice, but you are you're proficient in giving prophetic announcements. Mm. Well, that's that's such a loaded question, Bishop. So let me when when do I when 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 are we ending this at one o'clock or twelve two o'clock? <laughs> It's up to you. It's up to you. It's, uh, if you got a little time, we're, we're no, ending uh, technically. But if I'll, I'll hang with you as long as you can let me hang with you, and then they know we'll, we'll, we'll cut it off as you see, see fit. Oh, okay, because I didn't want to talk too long, and I didn't know what our time was. Uh, what I would say is two things. One, we we all need courage. You, you just cannot be in ministry, and you don't have any courage. God told Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Mm. See, strength is physical. Courage is mental. You can be strong and have no courage. Mm. And you can have courage and have no strength. Be strong and courageous. Um, we need courage. I think about, you, you know, the prophets, Jeremiah, Micah, Amos, Isaiah, Ezekiel, think about it, man. It took courage to stand against the kings of the day yeah. and, say, and say, thus saith the Lord. Those are dangerous words. Thus saith the book of Acts says, uh, these men, these are the men that have turned the world upside down yeah. because they, that there is another king and his name is Jesus. Prophetic preaching says there is another king. Mm. <laughs> And in the face of empire, which America is an empire, in the face of injustice, in the face of all that's going on, I'm glad. I said this when, when President Trump became president in 2016. I said, I looked at his Oval Office and, uh, and, I, and I named everything I saw in there. But one thing I didn't see in the Oval Office was a throne. I didn't see a throne in the Oval Office because we don't have a king in this country. We have a president. There's only one king in America. Uh -huh. And he shall reign forever and ever. And that is to me, Jesus Christ our Lord. So prophetic preaching is not just <clears throat> angry speech. It's not just calling out the government. It's not just calling out the president. It's not just calling out white supremacy. Prophetic preaching, I need somebody to write this down. Prophetic preaching announces that there is another way of living in this world that will please God. Mm -hmm. Prophetic preaching announces to the world that there is another way that will please God. So the reason why I'm calling out President Trump with his leadership is because I don't like when I see you putting money over people and profit over humanity and economy over people's health and their safety. That, that, mm -mm. I wish above all things that you would be in health, that you would prosper and be in health. That's God's way. Mm -hmm. So my stance on not opening up the church while we all want to go back is God wants me to care for the sheep. And when I see anybody with wolf tendencies, even if they're not a wolf, I got to call that out and say, no, 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 no. There's another way. Uh, mm. The reason I call out racism is because there's another way. It's reconciliation. It's understanding, listening to each other, respecting each other's humanity. When I see women being degraded and disrespected, like they're second class and lower, 
I speak against that because of Acts 2 and Joel, your sons and your daughters, you know, going to prophesy. I don't, I, I don't agree that women can't preach. That's my stance. I don't care where everybody else stands. You stand where you have to stand. I just can't do that because pro my prophetic declaration is there is another way that will please God more because we wouldn't know Jesus was alive if it wasn't for women on Sunday morning. We wouldn't have got Jesus if it wasn't for women, a woman who birthed him. So that's my, there's another way. Now, everybody may feel like you feel. That's why you got to have the courage to speak how you feel and, and believe prayerfully that God is backing that up. And hopefully that you're standing, don't use the Bible to divide, use it to bring people together. And so many people, I'm being prophetic because I, I don't believe it. I don't, if you are divisive, if you're not, if you're not, if you're not bringing people together, if you're not creating healing for people, if you're not creating the beloved community as Dr. King's described, where all of us with our differences can come together and be uh, united in humanity, that ain't, that ain't God. That's not Jesus and that's not God. Because Jesus said, Jesus said that they don't know you belong to me by how you love. So I would ask is what you're saying, preaching, believing, acting, is it loving? And if it's not, we got we to gotta shift it. So I don't know, Bishop. I, you, you got me in deep water out here now. No, so, I, listen. And, and I'm going to tell you something. The, the thing that I, uh, when I called you, and, and I, I've been led the Lord to, 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 to have it when I had you. Uh, Tolan Morgan came a couple weeks ago, a good friend out in uh, uh, Sean Teal uh, was with me. Uh, so, so everybody's been diverse. And then last week I had a young man, Simon Baylor, who is a, uh, uh, is a professional speaker. Mm -hmm. All of you have, have kind of brought that to us, to the, to the fact that, listen, part of the job of the church in pointing people to the cross yes. is trying to make people be connected again. And we must have the courage and strength to be, again, convincing without being combative. Yes. Because ultimately, people can't get corrected if, 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 if we can't get them close. Yeah. So, I, so I, I mean, even even like you said, being prophetic, and again, again, in our Pentecostal world, sometimes um, our passion uh, messes up our presentation. And I, I'm working on it personally, trying to say, okay, Lord, you, you said something that I thought, huh, got to really work on that. That my celebration may not have to be a hoop, mm. but it needs to be a word. Mm. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's something, that's something the Holy Ghost spoke to me clearly. Mm. So I appreciate it. I, listen, I got a couple of questions. One was, uh, one was what? What else are you reading right now? Somebody hit. What else are you reading right now? Let me um, let, let me go back track one second because I, I like to be balanced in what I say. We we um we, we we have to be willing to critique leadership. Period. Whether it's white or black, and and I was I was accused of somebody saying if 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 if, if President Obama had opened the country back up and done some of the things. That, that President Trump has done, you wouldn't have said anything. And I'm like, no, I, I think that I would have been like, President Obama, I love your black self, but <laughs> but no, doc, we not, no, we have to be willing to critique across racial lines and differences. But I just wanted to put that on there and say that even when it came to President Obama and some of his leadership, the church got quiet, black church got quiet because we love him. And we can't let our love for certain people still not allow us to speak the truth, which is why I will go to my grave saying we did Dr. Jeremiah Wright wrong. You know what Didn't I'm saying? Didn't we? Oh, now I'm saying this. Nah. We did him wrong. Can't, did him. Let me tell you, yeah, I had to talk to you offline because I could lose everything. But that, that is, that is. It's okay. Every time I think about, yeah, every time I think about that, oh, uh, and, and you know, it's so funny, just side note, I'll get back to the question. He shows the grace of a time because he didn't hold it against us. He could have come at us and said, I know you jokers ain't turning on me. I'm the reason you got access to what you got access to. But he was very gracious. I had a chance, I had a chance to see him at a, at a National Baptist Convention here in Florida. And uh, I asked him, I said, man, you know, how do you feel about kind of how we kind of went silent on you? He said, listen, he said, son, I grew up in a time when silence, and kind of what you said, he said, silence does not denote that people are not strong. They just were scared. And he said, I realized that, okay, you can be scared. I've got to be strong. 
And he said, just like I'm here, I'll make sure we see about you. He said, I, we were raised to kind of see about you. So that's just a little side note, but that's, that's about it. So what else you reading? Let me get back to what else you reading. So that's I, I'm reading a book now by Brene Brown, B-R-E-N-E. -E. Anything you can grab by Brene Brown will change your life. Right now, I'm re reading a book called The Gifts of Imperfection. Mm. The Gifts of Imperfection. And Brene Brown has studied on, done studies on shame and vulnerability, just helping us to wrap our minds around the fact that we are our strongest when we can be our most authentic <laughs> selves. And it freed me, Bishop. Like, the way I am right now is because of Brene Brown, man. She, she freed me. You, you don't gain people's trust by pretending like you're above them and you don't suffer from what they suffer from. You gain people's trust when you're able to say, man, I struggle with this. Or You know how preachers sometimes tell all the stories where they look like the hero? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, you know, and I, and I gave $20 to the poor man. But what, what about the times where you didn't make the right decision? What about the times where you messed up? Share that because everybody in the room knows what rejection feels like, knows what betrayal feels like, knows what it means to make a mistake, knows what it means to slip up. So share those moments without telling everything. I call it transformative vulnerability. We've been using the word be transparent. No, don't be transparent. Be use transformative vulnerability. And so Brene Brown's books have helped me. She has a book uh, entitled Daring Greatly, Daring mm -hmm. Greatly, D-A-R-I-N-G, Greatly. Uh, that book changed my life. Uh, Gifts of Imperfection. I've, I've, I've shown you Ta-Nehisi Coates' Between the World and Me. Um, what else am I Greek right now, so I'm reading a Greek book, but I don't think y'all want that. <laughs> <laughs> let me see. Uh, let me see. What else is on here? Uh, man, just invest. I tell everybody, invest in the HarperCollins Study Bible. It's a great investment for your study life. Um, I don't preach anything without con consulting the HarperCollins Study Bible. And so whether hey, you're honey, honey, he talk let me, let me get, honey, he said, I got to get another Bible. I just want to click <laughs> on Red, Red, Red said, I don't have to take a Bible, but I do need to buy another Bible. So God bless you. Just want to let you know. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not doing this view, interview at home, so my wife, I can hear that. You ain't finna buy no more books around here. <laughs> Man, so somebody asked me about the Greek book on here. So, yeah. do, so they do want to know about the Greek book. I'm shocked. So let me show it to you. It's called Read It in Greek. Read it in Greek. Yeah. Read it in Greek. And so it helps you break down, you know, ways to read in Greek. Um, so. My wife, my wife is hitting me over on Facebook. She's like looking at me like with, with the side eye. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Yeah, you got to go home to her, Bishop. You, you better stop. Uh, you, you're provoking now. Provoke not. <laughs> Provoke not. Uh, but, yeah. but lastly, so, I would you, say, so wait, the wait, wait, wait. HarperCollins Study Bible, and let me give you another one that really, really helps me. Um, whenever I'm teaching out of the Old Testament, I want to, y'all going to make me get up. Well, let me give you two. Can I give you two gifts? Keep, keep it listening. Keep on, keep on. All right. Luckily, luckily, I'm not like the uh, news anchor that had on pajamas. <laughs> You know, did you see that? <laughs> look, look, no, he didn't have on pajamas. He had on underwear. He had his suit on, his yeah, shirt, oh. and then had on his had on his underwear at the bottom. So at least I didn't stand up and reveal nothing. So, so for my preachers that want another book to help you in Greek, invest in this book. It's called Sparkling Gems from the Greek by Rick Rayner. This. When I tell y'all, 365 devotionals where they break down Greek words in the New Testament. So every day you can hang out with a new Greek word. By the time you get finished with it, listen here, they're going to say, boy, boy, he, 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 he a smartin, he a smartin. <laughs> and whenever I preach out of the Old Testament, I read, I, I do the, the Jewish uh, study Bible. Because you do know that the Old Testament is deeply Jewish. And um, and the Christianity was birthed out of J Jesus was a Jew. How about that? Yeah, right. <laughs> so so Christianity, um, the Old Testament is actually called the Hebrew Bible. We call it the Old Testament, but for the Jews, it's their main text. And so the deeper you understand Judy, uh, Jewish history, Jewish culture, 
it helps you understand the Old Testament better. So the three books I just gave you, if you if you invest in them, the the the, the Greek book, Sparkling Gems out of the New Testament, the Harper Collins Study Bible, and the Jewish Study Bible. I'm trying to tell you now. Amen. It'll change it'll change your preaching and it change your teaching. <laughs> That'll work. Hey, question. Uh, someone asked me, I saw it here. Uh, you or uh, you left a thriving ministry. Uh, most people don't realize you you had making happen, man. Oh, uh, man. And this is, this is the truth, man. I, I, again, I, I, that was another one. When you closed out your your classic, classic way, I think it was one of the anniversary. You said, I, I don't know what to say, but I want to say you were be not dismayed. I said, There you go. There you go right there. But the question is, when? how did you? How did you make that transition? Um, you you kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier. Uh, how did you make that transition? And then how did you also, I want to add this, how did you fit in? Because at the time you went to fellowship, Dr. Evans was still alive. Yeah. So you, you had to be respectful to the founder and to the guy you followed before you moved forward. So if you can kind of kind of speak to both of those. Well, and again, I mean, I, put, I even put this in there. And following, because you have a great pastor, and Pastor E. Dewey, uh, you know, Pastor Dewey has been, he, he's been, he's been with me a couple times, we, we kind of contact. So, you know, how did, how did you traverse that and, and navigate that? Uh, hey, how you doing? Uh-oh, uh-oh, so, uh-oh, so we got some, uh-oh. Uh-oh. Okay, somebody, somebody, somebody born in a, a, a Big Mac somewhere. Okay, yeah. There you go. Hey, I think he hit mute again. Um, yes. I'll just say this. You have, it requires courage and to hear from God. We can never allow uh, the people we serve beside to become the voice of God. Mm. Let me say that again. Never allow a human being to become the voice of God. Right. That human being can help you hear the voice of God. That human being can help you discern what the voice of God is saying, but right. never allow a human being to be the voice of God for you. Right. Um, does that make sense, Bishop? No, I agree. It makes a lot of sense. And I'm going to tell you something. I like that. Because even as I, the bishop, have assignment power, I'm yeah. really wrestling with sometimes that I don't want to assign someone somewhere that God has not anointed them to go, yeah, and they're only they're only going because I assigned them, and they're right. not anointed to be there. So I, I appreciate that. Yeah, and so we all, from 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 your seat as a bishop, with you know with with the weight of leadership that's on you, the, from my seat as a pastor, from all of the pastors, there are people that look up to us, but we still have to know we're not God, right. you know, and 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 there are people hear from God themselves. So I thank God for my pastor. When I came to him, I had heard from God that my season was up in making that I'd hit, I'd hit this ceiling. And it was like, you know, I just, I, I would get sick going to church um, Saturday nights where it was, I would almost become depressed and, and I love preaching and I love church and I knew something was wrong. I was like, no, I love preaching too much. I don't get sick when it's time to preach. If anything, I get energized. Uh, so right. I, I had to be honest, respectful, um, um, I, I had to go to him and, and be authentic and, and share what I felt from a place of transparency or, or as I said, tra- transformative vulnerability. And I had to shut my mouth. You can't tell everybody everything. You, you just because just, just you're mm-hmm. dealing with something and you feel some way or somebody says something that hurts your feelings, you can't run around here talking about it with everybody. Be quiet. The Bible says in Exodus 14, 14, uh, the Lord will fight the battle for you, and you, Message Bible says, you keep your mouth shut. Mm. That there, there, there are some seasons when God is shifting, God is working. We move with immaturity and make matters messier than they have to be. Mm. Hush. God will vindicate you regardless of what's being said. God will leave. If God told you it's time to go, if God shifts you, you don't have to spend your time fighting on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, responding to what, let people say what they got to say. Because somewhere I read uh, that he'll make your enemies your footstool and he will, 
He will restore the years that mm -hmm. the worm and the, you know, don't get me started, but all that stuff. So just, just, just trust the sovereignty of God. Don't feel the need to explain or defend yourself in every situation. And when I got to um, fellowship, man, that was providence. That was sovereignty. God brought me here and I had to move in honor and respect, which is, that's fine for me. I was taught that from my pastor because mm -hmm. his predecessor had served 47 years and he honored him until he died and still honors his wife now, even That's after right. So I learned honor from Dr. E. Dewey Smith Jr. Um, and so when I got to fellowship, I have no problem honoring Pastor Charles Jenkins. I had no problem honoring Dr. Clay Evans. And, and in many ways, I still honor both of them now. And so when you're the new guy or the new girl, don't ever go into a pulpit acting like the movie started when you showed up. <laughs> There are people who have sown seeds that you're benefiting from and you don't even know it. You don't even know all the stuff they fought for you. Discussions and arguments and, and pressing the ministry forward so that you could come and be able to do what you have to do in your time. So I'm grateful, man, for my founder. I'm grateful for my predecessor. And I will always honor them because I believe God's going to honor me for that. Because guess what? One day I'm going to be a predecessor. And I don't want to sow Amen. a seed. I don't want to sow a seed uh, of, of discord, disrespect, because one day I'm a, I may get sick. I may have to retire. I may have to sit down. And I want the person that comes behind me to say, hey, y'all, we're going to honor Sharp, take care of Sharp. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Oh, great, great, great question. Let me, uh, I'm going to close with 217. I'm going I'm to I'm keep it with 230. So 230, we getting off our time. That'd be 130 his time, as you know, he's central. Let me, let me ask, uh, uh, this along these lines. What are you, I, I, I may say this, how have you been able to manage such a big multi generational historical church? Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, I thought about, it. you know, one thing, I mean, you, you came with your pastor, Pastor Shepherd, and I know when Pastor Dewey came, um, y'all moved from Shoal Road to, uh, the, to, the, to the new church. You went to Macon. But I thought my, I just kind of don't miss it. You are in a historical, historical, in many regards, church. And you got a lot of older people. And I don't mean to be, I don't mean to be, I want to be very careful of saying this. In the Pentecostal movements, the way our movement is set up, I got a, I got, a, they got a place to run to. But Baptist churches, y'all can be kind of notorious, boy. You, you make a Baptist church mad, you be, you go put your keys in the door and that key don't work. How have you been able to traverse that? in that regard first let me say i don't have that kind of church and hey, reverend you. reverend dr clay evans didn't play no games he founded the church and it's in the fabric of the church to respect pastoral leadership so i'm grateful i don't i don't i don't i don't have those kind of fights and voting and all that we don't none of that foolishness um so i'm grateful that god put me there but you know, I, I don't know a way to say this. Everything about who we are, God is knitting us together from our childhood so that by the time we walk into where we were purposed to be, we, are, we have so many pieces to our puzzle that help us be and function in that area. Um, I grew up around my grandparents. Mm. I don't know anybody that's been around me for any period of time can pick up. I have an old soul. So while I'm just as young and progressive and radical in many ways and pushing the envelope and saying stuff that sometimes may rise, raise eyebrows, I'm just as old school as I can be sometimes. And so I have this blend. You know, I've always been cool. I was prom king in high school, drum major in the band, you know, pledged Alpha Phi Alpha. I've always had this relatability with my peers and the young people, but I've also always... I had old people looking forward to youth days when I was 16. They're like, I want to hear that young man. It's youth days, mama. I want to hear him preach. So they take up the front three seats, all the old folk in there, because I'm going to sing something old. I may quote something old. And then I have this old school preaching style. And so I just believe in everybody ought to be touched before service is over. I'm intentional about that. My preaching, I want to make sure my illustrations don't just reach older people, they reach young people, or not just young people, they reach older people. So I may quote some Marvin Gaye and some Cardi B. I may, you know, throw in a Real Housewives of Atlanta quote, and I may throw in um, 
uh, the, 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 the days of our lives and the younger, the young and the rest of us, you know? <laughs> so you got to have both. You got to blend and balance and make sure. But I am at a historic church and I feel like every part of my journey from my pastor's mentorship, watching my first pastor who was in his 70s when I was young, watching him uh, from, you know, just understanding. Well, you, you know, there's an African term called griot, G-R-I-O-T. A griot is a, story, is a storyteller. I feel, like, I feel like I'm a young griot and I'm holding the stories of my ancestors and my people so that I can share that with the younger generation. So I just feel called to preserve our heritage and preserve our history while at the same time interpret what's happening now so that older people can relate to. And, I, and again, I think uh, I've seen that. As a matter of fact, my, my, the folks that you when, you, came to, when you came to us, I think you did a workshop and the young people kind of gravitated to you. The older folks really didn't know you. I don't know many people in Florida Coco even knew you were, but you warned them, because I think the day you came even to our state meeting, you didn't wind up, wind, you didn't really preach that day. You just flowed with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And the older folks remember that they said, oh, he got it. He got it. And I said, well, well, I said what, what made you think he got it? They said, he flowed with the spirit. And I even told, because I think that was the day we were doing our commencement or graduation service. And I was telling him, I said, he showed a, what you do when you got the Holy Ghost. He didn't feel he had to do a performance, mm. but he had to follow the pattern of the spirit. And you won just, like I said, all the little mothers, he's such a nice young fella. You bring him on back, bitch. He already <laughs> bring him on. Let him know. We let him know yeah. we trained for him. Let, let me, let me, let me uh, close with this, because we're, we're running out of time. Uh, first of all, let me just say thank you again, my man, for taking the time to do this. You are a jewel to the body, uh, and I'm praying for you every day. Uh, when I'm not watching me preach, I kind of come get some of your stuff. So I'm just telling you, don't bring some of them sermons back to Florida, because uh, you know, <laughs> you know they go, did, did he take that from Bishop Penn? I'm saying, I, you don't have to say, I heard somewhere. So I'm just letting you know all your all your references that I heard somewhere. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Let me ask you if you were to close this time of discussion. What are you, what are the if you said three things you would say, Bishop, in this climate and in this season, what three things should believers really be honing in on in this hour? Hmm. I would say number one. We need to guard our mental health. We need, to, we need to guard our mental health. We need forums. We need uh, Zoom calls. We need services and conference, you know, whatever conference calls, however, gathering spaces virtually where we're being taught how to care for our mental health. Pastors are stressed, um, leaders are stressed. I can't imagine, like, Bishop, we see you laughing. Man, and, and, and I, you know, I, I don't walk this thing now. And that's why, my, that's why I love you, because you got a heart for people. And y'all are really blessed to have a bishop like this, because you could have somebody that does not care about you at all. But bishop, I cannot imagine how this feels to lead. I'm leading a church. You're leading churches through a global pandemic. And so you need time. You got to take time for you too. Self care, right? Uh, Hold on, now. you you were on my team with the Bibles. Now you met because my wife will start. And I, let me just kind of put a parenthetic in it. You made a statement. You were talking about couples, mm -hmm. and I and I'm gonna just be I'm feeling one hundred percent transparent to to the group. I kind of go on silent. If you can believe, I was shut my mouth, but I literally was not talking to anybody. I when I would get up in the morning, I would go through the day. Um, if I had to make a phone call, I make the phone call. When I get home, I get silent. And you made a statement one day. I don't even know if my wife saw it. You said, and for those of you who are around there being silent, uh, this not talking to your spouse foolishness. And I went to go, you know, Holy Ghost, why you got to go bother with Reggie? Why you got to have Reggie doing that kind of stuff right now? Why you got to have him doing that? But when you're talking about this whole mental health thing, again, you are showing, I believe, a prophetic unction that the Lord has given to you. Because as you're saying, People are struggling. I have a very good friend, and it, is, it has almost brought me to tears every time I think about it. He is a young man like you. His wife is battling cancer. 
Uh, and if God don't heal that girl, if God don't heal that girl, I mean, I cry every time I think about it. And my heart breaks because for the first time as a bishop, I never thought I'd be to the point of saying, God, I just got to trust you. I, I, can't, I can't fix it. I can't administrate it. I can't do anything. But watch and pray. So I, I appreciate that. Man. That's just, maybe that's what the Lord wanted me to get in there. But thank you. Guard, no, guard your mental health. Yeah. Oh, man, guard your mental health. Because it's a lot. This, 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 this is just... And then we dealing with pandemics on top of a pandemic. My, my heart goes out to that preacher and to you, Bishop. So I would say that we need to do that, number one. Number two, uh, we, we need to make sure that we don't just use language about praying, but we also use language about protesting. <clears throat> we, we need to have a civil voice. We need to have a voice for the culture in this season, too. I didn't say be the culture. I didn't say become the world, but we have to say, what are we going to, what's our stance in this fight? What's our, what's our prophetic stance as the church in this fight? You can pray and protest. That's right. You, 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 you got the right under the name of Jesus to flip a table over if you have to. You have a, you, you have a right to righteous indignation you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Pray and protest. And it's okay. It, 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 you know, it's not going to, um, you're not, you're not against God. Right. And number three, I would say we need to talk more about lament. Mm. Lament. You know, we love praise. When's the last time somebody held a service just to say, y'all, we're gathering together to just cry. <laughs> It's in the Bible. There's a whole book on called Lamentations. It's Lamentations. Jesus wept. Ezekiel wept. That's right. David cried. Elijah sat under the juniper tree exhausted. We have to have space for people to just gather and sing off of prayers and not feel the need to shout anybody, not feel the need to rush to hope. We can get to hope, but sometimes hope is in the lament. There's <laughs> healing in our tears, man. Mm -hmm. there, 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 are, there are literal chemicals that are released in the body when we cry that help us heal. And man, this right here, it, it'll make, man, when I saw that police officer with his knee in the neck of George Floyd, if that didn't break your heart, you ain't got no heart. You ain't got no heart. And, and if you can stand up every week and act like nothing's going on in this country, God bless you. I, you, get, you got a different set of rules that you live by. But sometimes it's okay to cry. I cried all through Sunday. The, the children got on, got on live and uh, the children came into the service and quoted scriptures. I cried. Mm. We, we, we had new members. We have 61 new people that have joined our church in a pandemic since we've been virtual. I cried. Got off the call. One of my members called to thank me for the sermon. She started crying. I cried. My best friend called me to pray for me because he knew I was tired and exhausted. In the middle of his prayer, he started crying. I cried again. And I talked to my therapist about it. I said, I've been crying a lot lately. She said, and I think that it's reasonable with the world we're living in right now that if you cried every day, nothing would be wrong with you. Mm -hmm. And so I just feel like lament, mental health, and we need to figure out as a church together, our, we're going to pray and protest. What, where are we going to be in this? Because racism has to be fixed. People have to go vote. People have to use their voices uh, to stand up against some of the systems of injustice. And I think those are the three things I would say to the church. I, I don't know if anybody's listening. But, uh, <laughs> you know what? You, you, you slip one in and if, listen. Uh, yes, it is okay to have a, a therapy. So hit us yep. on the bishop. Uh, you know, the Bible says, come, let's reason together. I mean, Jesus understand every now and then you just got to sit down and talk with somebody about something. Well, you can't say, I, well, man, my first point was guard your mental health. I can't, be a pro, I can't be a proponent for mental health awareness and then think that I'm sinful or I lack faith because I go get a therapist. Let me tell you something. Depression is real. You got pastors that have killed themselves suicidal uh, pastors who can't, haven't seen their members and members 
for it. No, 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 no. You can have Jesus and a therapist. Ain't no, it's no need to explain that. If there's somebody on here that, that thinks something's wrong with it, something's wrong with you. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with me. Look, you don't go to a therapist because you're crazy. You go to a therapist to keep from being crazy. Remember that. You go to a therapist to keep from being crazy. That's right. And I know some of y'all been praying, Bishop, you ain't been to your therapist lately. I'm going to try to go find one. I know, I know what y'all be saying. Bishop, oh, Bishop, oh. let me say this. Man, I love your heart. I, I just got to pause and just say, I I don't do this for everybody. I'm, I'm good and tired. I, I, I received a... Um, I received my first death threat last night. And did you uh, yeah, I did. I did. And and I was I was so out of it today, I almost just canceled everything. Cause I'm just I'm protesting tonight in the city with clergy. We're leading our churches. And I'm like, I'm all over the but bishop. I didn't say all that for me. I said to say, I love you, man. And anytime you call me, I'm coming. Uh this church is blessed to have you. Um, uh, you are a rare Jim, you may get tired, but please don't stop fighting. Mm. Please don't stop preaching. Please don't stop laughing. Please don't change nothing about who you are. Um, you are a gift to the kingdom of God. And I am not church of God, but when I tell you I could not feel, if I had, a, <laughs> if I had to give somebody an honorary Baptist license, <laughs> But listen, I'm, I'm, I'm taking them, you know, God bless you. If you need a youth pastor, a senior, I'm, I'm old enough to be a senior minister, so you let me know, I'll come, I'll come right on. Bitch, you. you ought to stop. You ought to stop. No, I just want to say I love you and your wife. I love the Florida Cocoa uh, District. Y'all y'all won me over, man. I just had such a powerful time with God. I had a powerful experience with God. And to those older, I remember those older ladies that I taught in that class. No, they blessed me. Mm. And so, to each and everybody, even every person on this call, I love you. Amen. Well, listen, we're going we're gonna to put up on the screen, um, let's see, we got a little situation here. We want to make sure that we sow into Brother Reggie's life, that you know one of the things we do is we definitely try to sow into him. So if you would, you can go to his, uh, uh, let me get myself together here. I got to go back down to Reg. It's Reginald Sharp, dollar sign, Reginald Sharp Jr., it's his cash app name, and I want you to make sure you are so into him. I want you to make sure that you are so into his uh, his ministry. Y'all, as you know, this is what we do. We, we put a little something in his hand. We give him a little something to get a little chicken box down the road, and, uh, and uh, we're praying for him. Again, I hope that everyone has been blessed by this time. Uh, when we started this, I didn't know what was going to happen on Teaching Tuesday. I just was obeying God. I just mm -hmm. I call the guy when they do it, and the Lord has been so gracious. Everyone has been phenomenal. And again, Pastor Sharp, you have, you have been phenomenal. Well, uh, late, 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 we're, we're praying for you. And uh, before we go, we want to pray with you and pray for you that the Lord not only will sustain you, but he will protect you. Uh, you are a clarion call in this season. So, Father, we thank you for your abiding grace. We thank you for your ever-present spirit. We lift up this, your choice servant. Father, we thank you that you've given them strength to be with us today, but we now ask you to give them strength for the days ahead. For the days of his life, so shall his strength be. And I pray now, God, that you keep him from all hurt, harm, and dangers, dangers seen and unseen. I pray now, Holy Ghost, that you would continue to baptize him, oh God, with wisdom and understanding, to understand the times, to know what to do. I pray for his lovely bride, oh God, and help them to stand shoulder to shoulder, oh God, and to love one another, to lift you up in marriage, but also, God, to lift the great ship up in ministry. I pray, God, that as you've placed him there, guide the ship, oh God, lead the ship, oh God, use him, oh God, to bring other people to fellowship, to discipleship, oh God. And I pray, oh God, that truly tonight as he goes out among the hedges and highways to share, I pray, God, that your light would be so evident that someone would see him and see that they need the Savior, that someone would see him and realize that they can be a person of faith and God, that they know they can still fight the good fight. Yeah. I pray you keep him from falling, present him faultless, oh God, and use him in this hour that when he closes his eyes for the last time, he would hear great words, well done, that good and faithful servant. Thank you for, again, us the time that we spent on this Zoom call. We thank you for the technology. But Father, we thank you that you are still working all things together for good. 
We pray for those affected by the COVID virus. We pray for those who are in this season of unrest, oh God. Peace of God, power of God, presence of God. Please, God, let there be released a move of God. And Father, we'll be so careful to give your great name, the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen.